tonight's Wisaka Bucha. It's a night to commemorate not in the full moon day and the month of Wisaka, which is straddles May and June. The Buddha was born. Thirty-five years later, on the same night, he gained awakening. And forty-five years after that, on the same night, he passed away into total nirvana. So we're commemorating a lot of events tonight. And there are a lot of things to keep in mind in, in connection with those events. But one very useful teaching is the Buddha's last words before he passed away, which was said to attain completion in the practice through heedfulness. He could have ended his teaching career with some nice platitudes about emptiness or nirvana, but instead he emphasized heedfulness as the essence of the practice, or the most essential part of the practice. There are places in the canon where he said that this was the quality that underlay all other skillful qualities you develop in the mind. Heedfulness, apamata, can also be translated as vigilance, non-complacency. In other words, there's a realization that there are genuine dangers in the world and you have to be careful about them. And the most important dangers are the ones that you create for yourself. Now, the sense of danger is, is an interesting thing to think about. It means that our actions really do make a difference. You have to be very careful that you don't do things that pose a real danger to yourself. Because your actions come out of your intentions, you have to look at the qualities in your mind that shape your intentions. Those are the real dangers in life. So you can't even trust your own mind, or you can't trust everything that comes into the mind, let's put it that way. The question is, well, who do you trust then? It's interesting the Buddha didn't say, go out and trust me or trust my teaching without testing it. In fact, his response to the fact that the sense that there is danger in life and that there are dangers inside your own mind is to give you guidelines on how to test your own mind. In the course of testing it, you make your mind more and more reliable so that you don't give in to laziness, so you don't give in to lack of mindfulness. You don't give in to complacency. You realize that there are urgent things that need to be done in this life. It's because of our own actions sh shape so much of our lives. And it's so easy to do things that are careless, so easy to do things that are just the quick way out. That we have to be careful. We have to have a sense of urgency. We have to have a sense of heedfulness in order to protect ourselves from those qualities. The most disconcerting of all the qualities in the mind is our own delusion, our tendency to lie to ourselves and to believe our lies. And again, it's not an issue of being deluded about truths that are far away. It's very simple things. We're many times out of touch with our own intentions. We're out of touch with what we're actually doing. We're out of touch with the results of our actions. And it's precisely here that we can create the most danger for ourselves. We can lie to ourselves about our intentions. Or when there's an action that causes something negative, we can lie to ourselves that it wasn't really negative or it doesn't really matter, or we really didn't really do it to begin with. Those are the qualities of the mind that you have to be most careful about, that you have to be most heedful to watch out for. Which is why when the Buddha gave his most basic teachings to his son, he started with precisely this issue of, one, being honest with yourself, being truthful to yourself. And then secondly, where to focus your attention? On your intentions, on your actions, and on the results of your actions. He said to look at an intention every time you act. What results do you expect from this action? If they're going to be harmful, don't do it. But again, be very clear that what you're going to do is going to have consequences. Many times we tend to forget. We do something because we like to do it, and we would rather not think about the consequences or feel that we're not responsible for the consequences. But every time you choose to act, there has to be a purpose. There has to be something you hope to attain by the action. So ask yourself precisely, what do you hope to get out of this? What results do you expect? If there are results that are going to be harmful, don't do them. Don't do the action. Don't act on the intention. 
If they don't seem harmful, then you go ahead and act. While you're acting, you watch to see precisely what results are beginning to come from the action, because many times those results will come while you're doing something. You don't have to wait until your next lifetime to foresee the results of your actions. Many of them come up right away. So watch for that. And if there's some unexpected harmful intentions, stop. Don't do it. Don't continue doing it. If there are no harmful act results that you find, then go ahead. Then when the action is over, you look for the long-term results. When you see that something that may have seemed harmless while you were doing it actually did, did cause harm over time, you consult other people in the practice to make sure that your perception is correct. Get their, at least get their perspective on it so you're not operating only on your own perspective. And then make up your mind you're not going to do that thing again. This applies to your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, not just external actions. But the same pattern goes all the way through the practice. There are other discourses when the Buddha says, look at the way you relate to sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. If the way you relate is causing harm, okay, don't relate in that way. Watch what you're doing to see where this causing harm. Simply in the way you react to your sensory input. When you're practicing meditation, if you look at the, your stages of concentration, once you settle into a stage of concentration, step back a bit and see what are you doing in this process of concentration that's still causing a disturbance or a burden on the mind. When you catch sight of the perception that's causing the burden, you drop it. In this way, the Buddha teaches us to cut through our delusion by watching precisely these things, what our intentions are, what our actions are, what the results of our actions are, both immediate and long-term. In this way, as we apply this test to our actions and as we resolve not to repeat mistakes that we've already made, we find that the process of testing ourselves in this way makes us more and more reliable, turns us into people of integrity, people that we can trust. This is one of the, most, the biggest dangers in life if you think that you cannot trust yourself or when you realize you can't trust yourself. Things are going comfortably, there are no great disturbances, and you're a good person. The Buddha says that's not enough to know that you really are reliable. It has to be in difficult circumstances when you see that you can still maintain your your precepts, you maintain your integrity. That's when you have a sense that you begin to trust yourself. Once you trust yourself, you can look at people outside that you're wanting to trust. When you're choosing a teacher, when you're choosing a teaching to follow, you become the best judge of whether that's a good teacher or a good teaching as you become more and more a person of integrity. As the Buddha said, a person of integrity can tell when someone else has integrity or not. People without integrity can't tell. They themselves are used to lying to themselves, so it's easy to lie to themselves about other people. But when they're truthful, they, they, when they have that element of integrity inside, they can sense its presence or its lack in other people. In this way you can gain, have, a, have a sense of which teachings are reliable that you can follow, that you can really trust, and which ones you have to be wary of. So this is what heedfulness teaches us. and it's, He's not teaching you simply to be wary and skeptical, but he's giving you precise tests for how you can test things, guidelines for how you can test things, so that you can find that what in, within you is reliable. And once you find what's reliable within you, then you can look around to other people that you're hoping to learn from and see what's reliable in them. And that way, heedfulness is not simply a wariness, but it's a a wise way of approaching the different way, the ways we might possibly live our lives. That's why, and this is also why this is the basic quality for developing what's skillful within you. One, you have a sense of the importance of your actions and of the danger, potential dangers for acting in unskillful ways. Once you have a sense of the dangers and some good tests or good guidelines for testing them, then you find that you develop more and more integrity as a person. You sense the importance of being skillful in everything you do, say, and think. 
And that means that you're going to be more careful in what you do, say, and think. And so it's in this way that the practice achieves completion. It's a basic teaching, but as the Buddha pointed out, he made it as the topic of his very last sentence, that it's essential to all the practices that we undertake to find true happiness. Because that, that's what the story of his awakening, that's what the story of his passing away is all about. And it's the serious search for true happiness, realizing that there's so many forms of happiness out there that seem desirable but are not really reliable, and looking at the actions that we do in, in quest of those forms of happiness, which are the actions that we can trust, that we can engage with a sense of confidence, and which ones are the ones that we have to, to drop, to abandon. So those were the Buddha's last words, and those are his recommendations for how to practice in a way that you really do develop a true happiness, a reliable happiness, a happiness that's not dependent on conditions. You look at what you're doing. Again, you don't have to look very far. Keep the practice close to the ground. Look at what you're doing. Look at the results. Look at your intentions. Look at your actions. Look at the results of your actions. And be very truthful to yourself about these three things. If you're truthful right here, then you will find the truth. The truth of the deathless is there, will be attainable. Truth isn't something that is not a quality of statements. Is this statement true? Is that statement true? The ultimate truth is the quality of the mind, the mind's truthfulness with itself, its willingness and its ability to admit the truth and to act on the truth. And that's how the truth is found in other ways as well. So we don't look for the truth outside, we start looking from it within. Once you gain a, this touchstone for testing it within yourself, then you can recognize it when you see it outside yourself as well. And this is important. If we don't find this kind of truth, we're subject to all kinds of delusions, all kinds of misunderstandings. We don't really have any sense of who outside we can trust. And that puts us in a dangerous situation. There really is danger in this world. But the potential is not something that lies so much outside, it lies more within ourselves. And it lies within our capacity to overcome that danger, to provide ourselves safety from that danger. So you can imagine the monks at the night of the Buddhist waking when they're expecting some special teaching on the wonders of nirvana or the wonders of the deathless. And they get this teaching instead. It turns them back on themselves, what they're doing right now. And so this is, the teaching should also make us reflect on what we're doing right now as well. The teaching comes across 2,600 years. Of all the things the Buddha could, could have said in the last night, right before he went and entered total nirvana, this is what he left as his final legacy for the human race. The reminder to be heedful. Because as you said, all fabricated things are subject to change, subject to passing away. So it's through heedfulness that we find what is not subject to change and what is not subject to passing away. Something that's not fabricated. As you said, heedful heedlessness is the path to death, but heedfulness is the path to the deathless. And it all starts right here within our own minds.